Ellicott Baptist Church live stream here. It just doesn't seem the same to be here on Rock Sunday without Gary bringing in a rock. So I have brought a little tiny rock there. But uh, we're going to be turning. We are in the book of, called Living Hymns. If you happen to have one of these, we're going to sing the song Praise Him, Praise Him. That is number 68 in our book anyway. If you want to join in with us then, that's the song Praise Him, Praise Him. Song 68. If you don't happen to have a song book there, we'll be projecting the words up on the screen there. hymns this morning as I drove in and I was going to uh, left my phone at home but I was going to take a picture of Pikes Peak as I was coming in on 94 beautiful sunny day snow way down on the mountain beautiful blue sky and uh, the choir on the radio was singing it is well with my soul oh, my. Forgot the name of the song by Isaac Watts, the, the wondrous cross on which our Savior died. Amen. Uh, and uh, just well, had a good time of singing, praising the Lord as I drove in this morning. And uh, just uh, trust and hope that uh, today we'll be able to do that together, <clears throat> even though we're not really together. I hope we'll be able to together give praise and worship unto our God and our Savior. Well, let me make a couple of announcements I mentioned to you uh, last week concerning uh, Sunday school. And our teachers uh, uploaded some videos or videoed some things, and then they uploaded those things. And today, uh, they should be on, the, on YouTube, is, if that's my understanding. And you should be getting an email sometime here soon that will give you those links if you don't know how to go out and find those on YouTube without that. But you should be getting links, and there are some things uh, for all of the uh, different age groups. Uh, I think especially 
the younger age groups, uh, four years old or so, Miss Evelyn's class uh, is go going to be getting a packet. We were a little late getting that out, but sometime you might want to wait sometime during the week. You should be getting a packet, which would have your Sunday school lesson and some other papers in there uh, that the kids will be able to work on and do while they're watching the Sunday school lesson. So I hope you'll be able to do that, and um, we're trusting that that will take place. Uh, each week we're going to be able to get a Sunday school lesson loaded up and uh, get those things done. And uh, so try to get some sense of normality. We're praying that uh, our country, our, our world will get through this and we'll get some, uh, be, an, be able to get back to gathering together as we have. And, and, uh, but for right now, this is, uh, this is what we're going to do uh, with the exception of next week. Next week is Easter Sunday and uh, we are going to do a service, a parking lot service. And uh, we're going to do it next Sunday morning at uh, 10 o'clock and so uh, we're going to do it all from your car we, we really hope you lord willing you don't have to get out of your car uh, we'll be outside a few of us will be outside we'll still be videoing videoing it and uh, doing those sort of things but we have a we're going to be able to do it we think over and your fm radio so you ought to be able to come park in the parking lot we'll have some guys that'll be uh, pointing you to parking spots. We're going to try to keep this matter of social distancing and all of those things. We don't, um, I wish we'd get out and hug each other and shake hands and those things, but uh, you know, we don't want to do that. Um, but we do want to try, in some sense, to be able to assemble, see each other. You can wave, beat your horn at each other. Not while I'm preaching, but uh, <laughs> you, can, you can wave while I'm preaching, but you can't beat your horn, all right? And, uh, and really, if you no leaving, no starting your car and leaving during invitation time either. Uh, we, we are installing those things that they have at the rent car parking lots, or if you drive out, it'll flatten your tire. You'll be out on 94 uh, stuck, and then you're gonna be in trouble, so. No. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, that's, that's our plan. And that will be going out on Facebook. We are gonna do it at 10 o'clock, so I, I wanna encourage you, if you can, Get her just a little early so we can get you parked and that we can actually begin the service at 10 o'clock. I'm going to try to keep it short. I've really been mindful. I know that some of you have small children. They're going to be in the back seat of your car. And uh, after about 15 minutes, I know their interest is going to wear off. And uh, so uh, we're going to do our best, maybe bring them a coloring book. Uh, Maybe they could watch their Sunday school lesson at that time if they can get a phone or a tablet or something like that. Maybe that's something they could do and it might keep them occupied along that line. But uh, we want to try that next week and we hope that uh, you will try to be able to attend and try to be here in your car. And uh, we still want to practice kind of the things that our, the, the government and the medical professionals are telling us to, but we would like to try to see each other and hope that that this will be a good service where we can honor and worship the Lord. I even heard the president uh, talking about it yesterday about how, how hard it seems that here we are in the United States of America on an Easter Sunday yeah. and uh, churches are not going to be able to assemble in the normal way that we do. We're going to try this and see how it works and, and we'll kind of wait for some feedback from it about how it, how it went. We will also, though our plan is, if you cannot make it, we will... Um, we will live stream this service as well. Uh, it'll be outside of them, but we're gonna try to do the same sort of thing. So uh, we hope that you can uh, come and participate. If you have some questions, you can send emails uh, to, to that email address. You can communicate on Facebook with uh, Brother Bill and Brother Jeff probably, and Brother Lloyd, they could probably give you some, Brother Bryce. Uh, don't communicate with me about it because uh, I don't, I don't know how to get on Facebook. So <laughs> anyway, so don't do that. So uh, that's what's going to happen next week, and we're going to take a shot at it. We're still going to have we're going to have services tonight at six o'clock. We're going to have Wednesday night services at seven o'clock, and this Wednesday night we're going to go back uh, like we have been on Wednesday nights here to our ABCs of Christian growth. We should be on letter H. 
uh, the lesson on the Holy Spirit. And then next Easter Sunday, we are going to go ahead and live stream the service at 6 p.m. And so uh, we're going to try to do all of these things and, and uh, try, to, try to keep as much a sense of normality as we, we can. And I hope these services have been a help and a blessing to you. I sure appreciate all of the people that have been, uh, jumped in and, and made this all possible uh, for us to do this. And they've been here a lot, uh, spending a lot of time going through the technical things and trying to get things uh, hooked up and wired up. And the singers have been practicing and, and uh, Sunday school teachers and um, guys have been video, video, videoing and things like that. So I hope it's a blessing to you. And uh, all right, let me ask us, let's go to the Lord here this morning and then uh, we'll move on. All right. Our Father, as we bow today in your presence, and the uh, Lord is our people all over uh, the eastern plains of Colorado and Colorado Springs, in the same sense, are uh, here together. And Father, we come and ask you, please, for your help today as we preach the word of God and as we sing praises to your name, as we remember, Lord, who you are. And when we do so, we should be reminded that there's not anything too hard for you. There's not anything that can overpower you or can surprise you. And Lord, we ask and pray that you would give your intervention in this uh, in this virus thing that is going through the world. Yes. And that we would ask you please for you to help some of these people, the scientists, some of the folks that are doing the study. We pray they might be able to, to find something that would really be able to treat and to help people that have this virus. And God, that you would help there to be reco recovery. Uh, we ask and pray, Father, the, the numbers concerning the deaths uh, really trouble us, Lord, and uh, it would really be our desire to not, uh, to not have that happen. <clears throat> but, uh, so Lord, we come and ask you please for your help and your intervention and pray that you'll give us wisdom, you'll give us strength, you'll help us to be strong in faith, you'll help us to be full of charity to each other, and God, that you'd be honored and glorified however all of this comes to pass and turns out, we just pray the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, would be exalted. And Father, today we come, and Lord, a couple of friends of Jeff's, uh, Barry and uh, his Nicole, Lord, and uh, Jeff knows them, and Father, both of these individuals are sick with this coronavirus, and God, we ask and pray, please, for your hand upon them, for the medical treatment that they need, we ask you to bless and help them. Um, and please, uh, Father, we're asking you to to give healing to their bodies, that they could overcome this and fight through it. And, and so we ask you to give them strength. And we know there are just thousands, Lord, in the hospitals. We ask and pray for your help there. I think, again, I want to mention Amanda, God, uh, for your protection upon her and her family. And God, just you keep your hand upon her. I know there are many other health care people. And pray for them. I ask you to bless them, Father. And we pray that you'd be, uh, Lord, your spirit will move among us, even though we're not together. Your spirit will move in our hearts as we sing and preach today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. We're going to turn to Psalm 524 in our song book, He Hideth My Soul. Again, that's Psalm 524, He Hideth My Soul. <laughs> Yeah. 
this morning to praise the beautiful Lord. Amen. I want you to open your Bible this morning to the Gospel of Matthew, the 21st chapter, and to look there at the beginning of chapter 21. <clears throat> As has already been mentioned, we are uh, today is, uh, is what's recognized in Christendom as what's called Palm Sunday. Uh, Gary likes to call it Rock Sunday. So in commemoration of that, we brought a rock equal to the size of his brain and uh, placed it on the pulpit. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I love you, Gary. <laughs> Matthew chapter number 21. Matthew chapter number 21. Uh, verse number 1. We're going to read the first 11 verses here in the passage. And, uh, so if you'll follow with me. It says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied in a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. This was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto me, meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt the foal of an ass and the disciples went and did as jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and they set him thereon and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way and the multitudes that went before and that followed cried saying hosanna to the son of david Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Father, we pray you would bless today the study and the preaching of your word. Lord, you be honored and exalted by all that's done here. And Father, uh, we pray that, that you would work in hearts through the message today. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we find ourselves today in the midst of uh, stay-at-home orders, almost nationwide in our country, uh, having to do with this coronavirus, you know, there have been, I've heard over the weeks, many issues that have been voiced uh, by the American people, especially um, one of those being, uh, does the government have the authority to order Americans to shelter in place? And in, in, a, in that sense, uh, take away our liberty. Uh, you know, from what I've been hearing and from legal men and things, lawyers that have kind of studied this, it does seem that, uh, that there is, when it comes to an issue of public safety, which this thing seems to be, that they do have the right to restrict our freedoms for a time. And I know that concerns us and worries us, but I, uh, we kind of have to look at what it is, what, what's for the, the common good, and what's for the best of, of, of those sort of things. You know, another question that I've heard is, so why are we taking such drastic measures for this virus when every year during flu season, Thousands die, but we never quarantine Americans. We never make a big deal uh, like this. We never shut down business or churches for flu or anything like that. And you know, as best I can tell, the answer to this question seems to have to do with the, the nature of this virus in the fact that it, is, it seems to be extraordinarily contagious <clears throat> and goes from person to person uh, like that. It can be passed very easily. Uh, you know, well, Paso County, uh, I read this article last week and copied it, but the county we live in has one of the nation's 
highest fatality rates, not the number of fatalities, but the highest fatality rates concerning this coronavirus, uh, surpassing communities in, in other states that have been hard hit by the disease. Uh, as of last week, I think it was, at least 13 deaths have been attributed to the virus in El Paso County. I believe that's up from the details of this last week. But uh, El Paso County had the highest tally among Colorado counties and uh, was roughly at that time, and, and may even be today, one-fifth of the total uh, deaths that are found in the state of Colorado. Um, as of the last, uh, last Saturday, El Paso County's death rate was at 5%. Among the uh, 286 people with confirmed infections, it was ranked sixth in the nation last week uh, uh, among the counties with at least 100 confirmed cases. That's pretty high. Um, and so we looked at that. They, but the, the point was that this coronavirus is not spreading in El Paso County faster than in other areas, uh, but rather that uh, it has kind of, it's, when it entered El Paso County, when people that were contagious with it uh, came into El Paso County, it, it came in the worst possible places. It was brought into a place where, where many senior citizens played bridge, and there was a bridge tournament going on, and many, many seniors were infected. It also came into a, uh, a long-term care, senior care center, where a number of other older adults were exposed to this and, and contracted it. And so it's been, it's been a, a place like that that it has really passed through and uh, caused a lot of havoc. And uh, so th that's one of the reasons why that question is answered. And I have a point to this. I'm not trying to just give you more information on this. One other argument that I hear is this. And uh, people say, you know, I feel fine. I'm healthy. I have no cough. I have no fever, etc. Why can't I go to work? and anyone who is sick stay at home. And you know, usually that works with the flu and things along that line, usually we can, we can make that work. But the answer to this seems to be that the virus that is going on right now is actually at its most contagious stage when people have it before they begin to show symptoms. That is, people can spread it uh, before they actually feel anything, before they actually have any symptoms that show. Uh, you know, the NBA players, there were 14 NBA players, uh, coaches, and staff that tested positive for this thing back a month or so ago when they shut down the NBA season. And uh, seven of those 14 had no symptoms whatsoever when they were tested and, and the coronavirus was con confirmed in them. Uh, the, uh, the, the nursing home in Washington State, where we really kind of heard the news of this, and, and uh, 23 of those residents, those seniors, tested positive for this virus. They found that 13 of them, when they were tested and the thing was confirmed, had no signs whatsoever. And the point seems to be that this is very, very it, doesn't, it doesn't matter how you feel. And that is one of the reasons why we're, we determined to kind of do what we're doing here. Again, I'm not trying to give you any more information concerning this. I have a purpose for this. You already have information overload, and I've not told you anything what you already know. You probably have scabbed knuckles and, uh, from washing your hands so many times, and every time you touch your face, you scream out loud and, and run and put sanitizer on your face. I don't know. But I want to illustrate this point. I want to use this to illustrate and preach this morning on this. You know, it doesn't matter how you feel, but it does matter what is real. Amen. See, there's a danger of being caught up in something emotionally, but there being nothing of substance behind those emotions. Right. Today, as I mentioned, it, it, we on the calendar, it's recognized as Palm Sunday. And what that does is uh, Palm Sunday represents historically the day in which Jesus Christ entered the city of Jerusalem uh, during the week in which he would die. It was his entry into the city. We call it his triumphal entry. It was a day which had been prophesied in the scriptures by the prophet Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. 
500 years before Jesus was born in that manger that these ladies sang about, 500 years before Jesus was came and took on flesh as a man and became a man, this was prophesied that he would ride into Jerusalem on a colt, the foal of an ass that day. And uh, when he did so, the purpose that Zechariah said was pointed out was this, this is God's Messiah. This is God's Savior. And in our text, we read that, it, that a great multitude, you can see it there in verse 8, and a very great multitude, as Jesus was entering the city, riding on this, uh, this donkey, spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And uh, <clears throat> they were surrounding Jesus that day. There was great excitement <clears throat> among the people as he entered Jerusalem, many of them being familiar with this prophetic passage, and I'll show you that in a minute, they use the word Hosanna. If you look down at verse 9, and the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna is to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They called him, uh, the word Hosanna would mean save now. They understood that. Now, they didn't understand he had come to die for sins, but they understood that he was the Messiah, and in their mindset, the Messiah was the one that was going to deliver them from Rome. And they were, they were all in, this multitude was. They were excited. They threw their garments down. They, threw the, they cut branches from the trees. We believe they would have been palm trees in many cases, threw them in the road before him in honoring him as the Messiah and the, the king. They called him, listen, they called him the son of David, an Old Testament term which signified that he was the Messiah. These verses here are from uh, Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. They were sung by the Jews at many of their feast days, specifically at this feast day, the Passover, and they were sung and they referred to the Messiah. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And what they are doing is they are giving him praise and glory and honor, and they are recognizing him as God's Messiah. Seems obvious from Matthew's text that many of them in that crowd believed that Jesus was God's Messiah. They believed at least at that moment. But if you'll fast forward with me in your couple of days in this Passover week that Jesus entered, and in your Bible, to the book of Matthew, chapter 27. Matthew 27. And you'll look at verse 15. As the week progressed, we studied this in some detail last fall as we looked at the Gospel of Luke. What Jesus did during this week after his entry was he would come in every day, teach and preach in the temple. And uh, the Pharisees were after him and questioned him and such. And, and they, uh, they determined they were going to get rid of him. They did not see him. The Pharisees did not recognize him as the Messiah. They wanted him dead. They wanted him out of the way. He was causing problems to them and their, their religious program. And they wanted him out of the way. And so what happened was, of course, they, uh, they held a false trial. And they uh, got him condemned. And uh, got him even condemned by the Roman governor, Pilate. And chapter 27, verse 15 is that account. Pilate on the day of the Passover, was uh, Rome's custom was to release a, a prisoner, and he uh, stands out before a large multitude there in Jerusalem, a multitude of Jews, and his, his, he wanted to appease the crowd, and so he would release a prisoner on that day in honor of their custom, and uh, as he did, he had hoped to be able to release Jesus, but notice chapter 27, verse 15, it says, now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would, and they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you? Now remember, Jesus had a multitude of people that had uh, called him the Messiah. They had recognized him as that as he rode in. And I believe Pilate in his mind and heart thought, Man, I'm gonna, I've got to get out of this. And this is a good way. And thought that they would call on Jesus. And he said, Who will you that I release unto you? Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ. For he knew that they, for envy they had delivered him. And when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? 
For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And so when the governor asked the question, verse 21, the governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release of you? They said, Barabbas. Verse 23, Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then which, with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. The point of this is that, that it's very easy to be emotionally moved concerning something, and yet it has really no true effect on your life. Let me illustrate again. Have you noticed a scratchy throat in the last couple of weeks in your own life? Have you felt warm? Thought maybe you just put your hands up there, thought like you were running the temperature, or you might have something. Maybe you took some medicine or some vitamins and went to the bathroom. As I mentioned to you, washed your hands. The next day, when you felt normal, when you woke up, the emotion that you felt the day before really proved to be nothing. Now that's one thing. I'm not down like this. But I, but I want to stress to you that spiritually speaking, when you get caught up in, emotionally, and you make a promise to God to make some changes in your life, you get afraid you might go to hell, you call on God and say, please, Lord, forgive me, save me, or you're worried God's going to get you. And then over a period of time, nothing happens. The changes prove to not be real. That is something that has consequences far more severe than this virus we're talking about. Yeah. You know, I'm afraid that sometimes we as Christians, we, we become like spiritual groupies. We go from preacher to preacher, from message to message. We get titillated, we get convicted, we get challenged, but we never get changed. That's right. We never get changed. Hey, listen, I'm not saying emotions don't play a part. They do. But feelings are deceptive. Mm -hmm. And they really have a tendency to blur what is true and what is real. This matter of fear that we're struggling with on a real physical consequence, I, I've experienced it a time or two, and I've had to say, hey, man, man. <laughs> what are you sitting here fretting over there? Turn the TV off. But the truth of the matter is, is that some folks, and I remember even as a young, uh, being exposed to Christianity as I was a younger adult, and when, it, when that happened, I remember struggling with those emotions sometimes and, and uh, battling with those things. And, and listen, feelings are deceptive both ways. And they can blur what is really true in your life. You know, the idea, I've been preaching kind of topically, and I, I haven't forgotten about the book of Revelation. And I, I, I want to get back to that. I just haven't felt uh, there's no way in the world I can do that in 30 minutes. Uh, I can't do this in 30 minutes. And uh, so I have kind of stayed away from it. But I also have felt it's a good time to kind of deal with some things in our lives and to encourage us from the scriptures of these. And the idea from this message actually came from the sermon that Brother Bryce preached on the parables last Sunday night, where he talked about the parable of the rich fool over there in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, and verse number 15. You see, that was about a certain rich man that had, had a great abundant harvest, and uh, he, uh, he had so much that he had no place to put all of the crops that he had. And so it says in verse 17 of Luke 12, it says he thought to himself, and what he decided to do was that he would build bigger barns to store all of these new crops. He'd tear his old ones down, build bigger ones, and fill those up. And his reasoning was this. It was based on the feeling 
uh, in verse number 19, he said, I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. And what I'm telling you is that when Jesus is pointing out of that parable, he's describing a man that said to himself, man, things are going good. I am going to lay up and I am going to have a great future. But he based that upon his feelings. Not upon what was true. Because God, according to the Lord Jesus, God appeared to him that night and said, thou fool, tonight thy soul shall be required of thee. God was going to take away his earthly life that night. There would be no enjoying the benefits. Can I stress to you, it is not how you feel this morning that matters. You may feel that things are okay, your life is good. In fact, you may even tell me you believe in Jesus. Couldn't be that you believe like some of those people that were following him on the way to Jerusalem that day. You may have made a real decision for Jesus. Let me ask. Have the changes in your life lasted? Have they lasted? Are they real in your life today? Is there real change in your life today based upon Jesus? Do you know for sure things between you and the Lord are good? That they are real? Not feelings. They are real. Not just emotion, not just feeling, but you have a confidence that you know him. Now, catch this. And that he knows you. Yeah. You see, that's really the key. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, says that in the last day, many are going to come to him and say, Lord, Lord. Have we not prophesied? Hey, we've done religious works. And uh, have we not cast out devils? And haven't we done all of these wonderful works? And Jesus said, Then will I profess unto you, Depart from me, I never knew you. I just quoted that a little bit, but that's Matthew 7, 22 and 23. I was talking to someone this week, and uh, uh, they were talking a uh, they're older adult, and they were relating how their family was taking great precautions to protect them from any chance of catching this virus in the sense that it was almost quarantining them in place in their own, uh, they, on their property, the family, they lived with their family, and not letting them really see any of the other family, grandkids and things along that line, and delivering meals to them, et cetera, trying to keep them from having any chance of exposure to this virus. And in the process, the person told the family member, uh, that, that was doing all this and said, you know, uh, he was explaining why this, was, why he was doing this, and they, they said, you know, I'm not afraid to die. Mm -hmm. right. Hey, that ought to be true of you today. Yeah. I'm not saying you ought to want to die today. That, that's not we're not, we understand that joke about that. You know, I don't want to get on the next bus. But the truth of the matter is there ought to be a confidence in your life today that I'm not saying you should be fearful of in some sense have some fear that is a, a real true fear of not wanting to pick this thing up. You ought to do what's careful to not do this. But listen, do you have that confidence to know that if whatever could happen to you when your life ends, you will immediately be present with the Lord in the life to come. Well, how do you get that confidence? Well, first of all, you, you have to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I actually saw Franklin Graham on a quick ad last night on television. And he and his group uh, had built a hospital there and uh, Central Park, trying to help with the coronavirus, trying to do this, and they've got doctors and medical people that volunteer. But I heard him come on the air, and, and uh, you know, he only had 60 seconds, and uh, praise the Lord, he, I've heard him twice in the last week on radio, too. 
uh, trying as best he can to squeeze the gospel in, to try to say, look, you don't have to be afraid of this. You, there's, a, there's a way to have peace in the midst of this. And, but the, the, the idea is, is that this peace is in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, you enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ by recognizing that you have no relationship with him and you have no relationship with him because you're a sinner. And your sin has to be dealt with and you also have to realize you can't deal with it. There's no way you can fix your sin. You have to be willing to repent. And when you repent and when you trust and believe on Jesus Christ, that he will forgive you based upon what he promised in his word and based upon what he did on that cross and the fact that he rose again the third day, he promises to give you eternal life. Probably the most popular verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. That's where the confidence that's where, the comp that's where the reality of saying, I know I'm right with God. I realized that sometime in my life I was a sinner. I repented of that sin. I called on Jesus Christ as a sinner, and I asked him to forgive me, to come into my life, to save me from my sin. And based upon his word, he did. And I'm going to tell you, when that happens, when that is true, there are changes that come. He is real. There are realities in your life that show up. I'm not saying you're saved by your works. I am saying there are things that are real that come in your life when a person enters into a relationship. Because when you do that, you can have confidence that Jesus Christ will not let you go. When you believe on him, he will keep you and he has given to you eternal life. And he has promised you that in his word. 1 John 5.13 these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Based on his work, you enter into a relationship, you can have that confidence. That is real. It is real. And you can get sick and you can die, but Jesus Christ never leaves. And you have eternal life when you believe on him. Amen. And that will never leave you. Based upon the word of God. But you can also have that confidence. That confidence comes up in this. Based upon how you react. And who it is. And what it is that you trust upon in the hard times of life. That's what I'm saying when I tell you that it doesn't matter how you feel. It matters what is real. I want to give you two examples from Scripture and I'll be done. Go with me to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 12. 2 Samuel, chapter number 12. I'm reading this this week in my Bible reading story of the account in scripture of David's sin with Bathsheba. David had committed adultery with a lady that was not his wife, but another man's wife. The lady became pregnant. Bathsheba became pregnant. Uh, the man was one of David's soldiers. He was off in battle. And David tried every way he could to manipulate that soldier. He brought him back from the battlefield, tried to get him to go home to, to lay with his wife. That the man would believe that the child was his rather than David's, and the man had enough character that he would not do so. God prevented it from happening. And David, in his concern of that he might get caught in his sin, had the man murdered by putting him on the forefront of the battle. And then he married the man's wife, and she gave birth to the child. But God showed up in the person of Nathan the prophet who told David a little story that got a hold of David's heart and David uh, said, boy, that is unjust and the prophet said, hey, I'm not talking about the, the man that killed the lamb, I'm talking about the man that killed the man that stole his wife and that's you. David repented 
repentant. David was already saved. He repented. He already knew the Lord. He'd been caught in terrible sin. And as that happened, he repented. The prophet said, David, God's not going to kill you. But he is going to judge you. He passed a judgment upon him. And he said, fourfold. Just like you let David pronounce his own judgment, actually. And God said, I'm going to follow through with that. I'm going to judge you fourfold. And meeting people in his family. And the little baby that Bathsheba had had with adultery with David got sick. And the Bible tells us here in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and uh, verse 15, it says, And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth, and the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, he spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto her voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose. That's what I want you to see. He arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself, and changed his apparel, and watch, and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he didn't eat. You know, this absolutely astounded David's servants that could understand this. How could he worship God? He could not spare his child. How could he do that? Well, the reason David could do that was because God was real yep. in David's life. Now, when I, the account I just told you from 2 Samuel 11 and 12, you might question whether David's relationship with God was real. You might question that because of what he did and the sin that he was involved in, and yet he was a believer, and yet when he repented, when he got right with God, even though God did not fix his circumstances, David came before God and he bowed before him and he worshipped him. That is, he ascribed to God worth. He ascribed to God honor. He, is, he glorified God by worshipping him at this horrible, terrible time in his life. These, his men couldn't understand. Uh, we, would, we expect a person to get mad over that. How could God do this? We don't hear that from David. David worshipped. Right. He worshipped. He bowed before him. He acknowledged him for who he was. And that he had the right to do what he chose to do. Yep. In David's life and in his son's life. You might say, well, what after, after what David did, it seems that God was merciful to him anyway. And I would agree, God is a merciful God. But what I want you to see here is that as David did this, when he found out what had happened... David's default response, that which came automatically to him, was to go into the house of the Lord and worship him in the midst of horrible, sorrowful circumstances. He worshiped God. He did not get mad at God. He turned to him. Yeah. Hey, that says something. That's true. Yeah. 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 You might say, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He's already in sin with God. It's kind of David's own doing. Well, turn it, turn ahead to turn to the book of Job. Job chapter number one. Job chapter one. Familiar to most of us. Here in Job chapter one, we get a picture of Job, and we get a picture of what's going on in heaven that we never really see. And God opens heavens up, heaven up for us to, to let's see some spiritual things. And here in this account, the, the devil with his demons, and the, 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 the devil appears. Uh, with the sons of God, I will be careful there. The, the devil appears, Satan appears before God, and God challenges him with his servant Job. He says, Hey, have you noticed my servant Job? 
just man that fears God. He's, he, he hates evil. He serves me. You, you ever notice him? The devil says, yeah, yeah, whatever. I can't get to him. He won't let me touch him. He won't let me touch his stuff. You remove your hedge from him and you watch. You watch. I'll give him the curse you to your face. Now, I'm reading in a couple of episodes here, but God says, good enough. Tell you what, Satan. I take the hedge away. Yeah. Everything he has. You can do whatever you want. You just can't touch God. So the devil goes in, you know the account, built a very wealthy man, and in one afternoon, it seems, all of Job's wealth is destroyed. Everything he owned, everything he possessed, everything he worked for, gone. Well, it didn't stop there. Job had 10 children. And in one event, all 10 children were killed. Same day as he lost everything. Look at chapter 1. Look at verse 20. It's right after he gets news, all his kids are dead. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. I just can't get past that. Says, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the scripture puts this here. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God with his sin. God was real to Job. Worshipped him. He honored him. He expressed his love to God, his adoration to him. What I'm trying to get us to see is, is this. And Job was, God was real to him. And I'm trying to ask you this morning are you right with God? Is he real to you? You may say, you know, I feel like I'm right with God, but I'm not asking you if you feel like you're right with God. No. I'm asking you, is he real to you? Like I said, many of us have probably felt like we have this virus because of all we've heard and how we feel, but thank God most of us don't have it. Who we don't have it? And that'll prove itself on after this goes on for a while and we stay well. But you know there are many people around the world, and especially in America, that feel like God is in their life. That things are okay between them and Him. But the danger is that many people who feel that way don't really have God in their life. They're not really in Him. I'm not saying He's not around them. I'm saying He's really not in them. And their life proves it that out as they go about their daily living. And God's not real. As I already mentioned, the consequences of you feeling that things are okay between you and God and them not being is far greater. It's far greater than if the person actually had this virus. The best this virus can do is take away your little faith. You're a believer in Jesus Christ. It cannot take away eternal life from you. Yeah. If you understand the scripture, you recognize that as good as this earthly life may be, it can't hold a candle to me to eternal life. You see, it does not matter what you feel. I know feelings are important. But what matters is what is real. Do you know today, do you know that God is real in your heart and life?
is that your is he your default for Peter? Is it natural for you to carry with him times of trouble and times of trial? Is it natural when you have sinned? Is it natural for you to be convicted and to turn to him and say, I'm sorry, God. Is it real? Is God's your relationship with him real? And that's what I want to leave you this morning and ask is, that's not true. And the only way I can tell you you'll know that is only God revealed it to us. If you really want to know. That's not true. He knew something about it. He explained to you how that happened. It happened through the person of Jesus Christ. You get serious, you get real with him, and you receive him. Christian, are you in sin today? get real with God and let him deal with your sin. He promises to deal with it. Forgive you, cleanse you, and get it out clean. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the truths of your word. I ask and pray, please, for your help today in the hearts of those that have listened, Lord, those that have heard. And if there be somebody, Lord, you have uh, you pointed out to them that their feelings are deceiving them. There's not really any reality in their lives. And, and Lord, by chance, they happen to be watching today. Maybe they're being forced to be watched. But maybe today you make known there's not reality in their lives concerning their relationship with you. I pray, Lord, your spirit would deal with them and draw them to the person of Jesus Christ. And you'd be honored and glorified and exalted. We ask it in Jesus' name. I'm not going to give you the time necessarily of invitation. Today I have given you an invitation, but we're going to sing today. And we're going to use our closing hymn, page 579, God will take care of you. I want you to consider that. If he's real to you, he will take care of you. If he's real in your life, that thing, he'll take care of you. I want to encourage you today to do that. Let's pray. Well, we've been closing our services here by live stream with this song 579. God will take care of you. Join me.